All right. I promise not to take as long this time. So um, Dr. Baltazar wanted me to talk about post-phlebitic syndrome. What's post-phlebitic syndrome? It's your Unaboot clinic. It's your ulcers. It's, it's the patients who uh, have had a DVT, otherwise known as post-thrombotic syndrome. So these are your patients who we talked about the SEEP classification. These are your C5, your healed ulcers, or C6, your active ulcers. So very common. Uh, a lot of these can be mixed arterial and venous ulcers, so something you're going to need to consider as well. Um, very expensive, very uncomfortable. These are the patients who wear all those multi-layer compression wraps, who have the weepy, oozy, smelly um, ulcers, and end up uh, just going to the nurse practitioner clinic or the wound care clinic. These are going to be some of your happiest patients. I, similar to Dr. Coogan, I love my venous ulcer patients. Patients who have superficial uh, venous disease and varicose veins, they can be happy too. Um, but these patients don't care about the hemocytorin deposition. They don't care about the stripes on their legs. They just want you to heal their ulcers, and they will be forever grateful to you. Um, so just to give you a classic case, uh, this 65-year-old gentleman, he was a physician. He had a recurrent right medial malleolar ulcer over the past five years, healed, uh, opened up again, healed, opened up again. Uh, now healed, he then developed one on the same side, a lateral malleolar ulcer, intermittently wearing stockings, depending on whether or not he had an open ulcer, <clears throat> or wearing his wound care dressings. Uh, pretty classic history you're going to see. He had had five knee interventions. Uh, he had had a DVT 20 years ago that was thrombolyzed. Um, he had had some superficial venous procedures. He had a laser ablation of that right greater saphenous vein. He had had multiple um, uh, episodes of phlebectomies or sclerotherapy. Uh, so again, multiple procedures done on his right leg, lots of things going on. On physical exam, he had an area of healed, uh, uh, that was clearly a healed ulcer on the right medial malleolus, had some of that scaly, scratchy, sort of whitish looking skin that you see from healed ulcers. He had an open malleolar ulcer on the lateral side, and he had some uh, edema around the area. Couldn't really see any um, varicose veins. That is a classic patient that you're going to see. They're miserable. They've had multiple uh, venous interventions. You may have done multiple venous inter interventions. So what are the fundamentals of uh, uh, treating patients who have ulcer disease? First three things on your list, compress, compress, compress. You've got to get that edema out of there. You've got to get the uh, swelling down so that the arterial blood can get to the ulcer, that you can get oxygen to it, so that you can have venous drainage from that ulcer to take care of all the uh, toxins and things that are underneath the ulcer so that it can heal. The patients have to be compressed. Um, what's going to be one of your uh, uh, caveats about compressing a patient? 65-year-old person may have had a heart attack in the past, a couple cigarettes. Yeah, having peripheral vascular disease. So most of us will only compress patients who have an ABI of 0 0.5, 0 0.6, or greater. So last thing you want to do is compress them, and then they have no arterial inflow. Uh, but I think you can also not be so hard and fast about that rule. I don't know what you do, Dr. Lumsden. Usually it is I compress the patients. I just ask them how they feel. If your toes are getting numb, let me know. Uh, you want to put them on oral antibiotics. You want to decrease the, bi uh, the um, burden of bacteria on their wound. Uh, you want to debride any dead tissue, any biofilm, any that yellow, yucky slough that builds up. Uh, even if you need to take them to the operating room, put the patient under anesthesia to scrub that wound so that it is clean. That may be what you have to do. You want to maintain a moist environment. You want some type of uh, primary dressing. There's a lot of secondary uh, wound dressings out there, some of the biologics, aplograft, others that are available. I, my wound doctor only usually recommends these for refractory ulcers or in folks that have had recurrent ulcers and failed other dressings. They're not used as a primary wound dressing. Do you all know what I'm talking about? Aplograft, some of these, uh, what are some of the other ones, uh, Ulysses? Uh, Acehill. Yeah, uh, Ace. Yeah, they're incredibly expensive for these little two by two pieces. It may be a couple thousand bucks. So something to consider, your hospital will not be happy if you're using them instead of just uh, uh, wet to dry dressings. 
you want to exclude any correctable pathology. So you want to eliminate the highest point of reflux or any type of proximal obstruction. Uh, Dr. Coogan already talked about this. I won't go into uh, detail about the procedures. Um, this is this patient that I talked about, the 65-year-old male physician. Uh, his ultrasound showed uh, reflux in his uh, right femoral. This was when he was standing. He had even more prolonged reflux. You can see where you compress the vein, you get augmentation, let go of the uh, limb that you're looking at, and you see continued reflux through that valve. The uh, waveform should return to baseline if the valve is doing its job. He had popliteal vein reflux, that's standing with a cuff, saphenous vein was ablated, yay. Um, lesser saphenous vein reflux as well, and then this is the edema. He needed to be compressed even more. He needed to keep his leg elevated. <clears throat> Dr. Coogan talked about IVUS instead of uh, traditional venograms to actually measure the inside of the veins if you're looking for a higher point of uh, uh, disease on the patients, any type of more proximal iliac vein uh, uh, lesions that might be contributing. Remember in the case I presented, I already ablated the man's saphenous vein. I'd already done multiple uh, phlebectomies. I'd already looked at his deep system. He had reflux. What I hadn't done is look up higher, and he was having recurrent ulceration. <clears throat> Dr. Coogan talked about uh, uh, Dr. Raju. He's a past president of the American Venus Forum. He's pretty much written the uh, books on uh, venous stenosis in the iliac venous system as well as the IVC. Uh, and uh, so I would encourage you to read uh, anything by Raju and Neglin. They are in, well, Neglin's not there anymore, but Jackson, Mississippi. I don't know where they got all these venous patients in Jackson, Mississippi, but they did. Uh, you can look at the literature on this. The dressings do account for a high percentage of the costs of these patients. I talked about the you know, billion dollar cost of taking care of venous ulceration. Uh, one of the reasons we don't have the nursing resources to take care of these patients. Your clinics are full of uh, wound care clinics. The patients uh, do not have transport sometimes. And if you can get them off these dressings, you're saving not only the dressing charges, but you're also saving in the personnel charges as well. You can uh, review by uh, Dr. Kahn in circulation. They did a, a nice review article and some recommendations on taking care of ulcerations and looking at the pathophysiology of PTS or ulcerations. Again, obstruction and reflux are the things that you need to remember. Uh, this is an old article, 20-something years old. Again, obstruction and reflux are going to be the most common things that contribute to ulceration, and I can't say that enough. You saw, I don't know why, uh, Dr. Coogan talked about that there can be alternative points of compression up in the pelvis where the veins are fixed, where they run across bony prominences. Again, Raju and Neglin have written the the most of the papers on iliac vein lesions, and if you put them in PubMed, I came up with 52 publications on iliac vein disease from them. So again, uh, they are the gurus on this, but they have really shown that it's not just May Thurner, the things that you know are common, other areas that you need to look at as well. But the point is, is looking for a higher point of reflux on these patients and not missing uh, things above the inguinal ligament. That's also what's going to differentiate you from your non-vascular surgery uh, uh, colleagues. So I'm not going to talk about that. Dr. Coogan did, but again, high index of suspicion. Um, I am going to mention open surgical procedures because we talk about ballooning and stenting uh, for iliac vein lesions. Have any of you all been involved in those procedures? Yeah. So there are open surgical procedures. Most people consider these of historic interest only and that they belong in the Smithsonian, but I would say that it's something that you need to be aware of because it's something that only you as a vascular surgeon are going to be able to do, and there's going to be some patients that you do want to offer this to. Uh, there are multiple different open surgical procedures. A couple that I'm going to mention are older, such as the Linton procedure, but and uh, SEPS procedure, but there's some bypasses and some valve transplant information that you do need to be aware of. What are the indications for open surgical procedure? Really, it's going to be patients who are refractory to conservative management and some that may have failed into vascular treatment or don't even have that option. So who might be a patient who doesn't have that option? 
uh, I had, have a young uh, Iraq Afghanistan veteran. He's in his 30s. He came to me. He's got multiple varicoses on his lower extremity. He's got tons across his lower abdomen. He is miserable. His legs are swollen, lower abdomen swollen. What happened? He got shot and he ended up having a cable disruption, which was done over in the field, and he's coming back. I didn't know what to do for him. I did multiple testing. What did I do? I called Eric Peden at Methodist Hospital uh, for a possible bypass procedure on this young man. Lenten procedure, it's just old. This is where they used to fillet the leg open and divide the perforator veins. We have much better ways of doing that now. The Linton procedure was followed in the late 90s uh, and early 2000s by what was called SEP, subfascial endoscopic perforator surgery, just showing you how we got to where we are. People had recognized years ago, 50 years ago, that perforators were going to possibly be important, and so they developed better techniques. Uh, now, again, I like to brag about some of my fellows <clears throat> and things that they have done and presented and looking at the role of perforators in taking care of patients who have ulcerations. Again, most vascular surgeons will not ablate perforators or divide perforators, sclerose perforators, unless patients have a history of ulcer disease. I don't know that treating perforators has a role in patients who have a varicosities without an ulcer. Uh, the uh, American Venus Forum uh, SVS guidelines, which are currently in the process of being rewritten over the next couple of years and revised, uh, state that perforating veins, which are considered pathologic, so they've got reflux, they're dilated, should be treated only for C5 or C6 disease, and that's the official guidelines. There are valve procedures. I uh, will mention these. Uh, a lot of work has been done over the past couple decades looking at different types of valve procedures, whether it's a valvuloplasty, which I'll show some pictures of fixing the valves, or a neo valve, something that you've developed in the lab. So you all are young, you're smart. Um, my challenge to you would be look at the procedures you're doing and see, is there a better way of doing this? Could I partner with somebody in engineering? Could I partner with somebody uh, who uh, is in industry to try to develop something new? Because we do need some work here. Um, I mentioned down here transplantation of valves. You know, you can take out an axillary valve or a brachial valve. Dr. Lumsden had me do one when I was a fellow at Emory. It didn't work. Um, it stayed open, but I don't know that the patient got any better. Uh, people talk about doing endovenectomy, endoflebectomy, taking out some of the sonicae that end up developing, in, the webs end up developing inside the vein following a DVT. The problem is, is there's a high rate of thrombosis. Once you touch the inside of the vein, the flow is so low, the pressures are low, they thrombose. Uh, valve reconstruction, eh. again, this has been done. People have talked about it. Really what we need is a new valve. Um, I talked about some of these floppy valves. Uh, some folks, uh, really Dr. Kissner, who I don't know how old Dr. Kissner is, probably 80, 90 years old, but there's some recent work. Um, I found one article in 2016 looking at doing valvuloplasty. So it's opening up the vein longitudinally, so maybe the femoral vein, and plicating the valve. So taking that redundancy that's out of the valves and making them a little bit tighter so that uh, there, you have more function without, again, thrombosing the vein. There's been some reports looking at banding, putting a little jacket on, but uh, again, incidence of thrombosis is high. And those are just some pictures uh, in the more recent years of plicating uh, veins. You're really doing this with 7060, tiny little vessels. Patients have to be anticoagulated afterwards. Uh, neo valves is what I want to mention. Again, this research has been going on here for decades. Nobody has developed a new valve. So whether they're something that will absorb over time or something where you're taking a, a uh, some other uh, valve from a cadaver, a valve from an animal, to, or developing your own to put into the vein. So this could be catheter-based. You could develop something great. You could be rich, and you could not have to worry about buying an RF generator in the future. So different reviews have been done. I looked at a Cochrane review from 2015. Um, the uh, outcomes of any of these surgical treatments, there's not large studies. Not many people do it. Uh, and again, the results have not been great, which is one reason people uh, 
don't specialize in this and they don't make it a point of their practice. Uh, deep valve reconstruction, this is from Australia and New Zealand journal from 14 years ago. Again, not many patients done for C6 ulcerations really is a last ditch effort to try to heal the patients, but something I think you need to keep in the back of your mind. Venous bypasses. Uh, these are very specialized, and again, my patients are going to go to Dr. Eric Peden here. Name is spelled P-E-D-E-N in case you have a referral in the future. Um, and these are really going to be long bypass for segmental occlusions for very symptomatic patients, such as the uh, <clears throat> young Iraqi uh, veteran that I mentioned. Um, so part of the problem is, is you have an interventional radiologist, they're looking at just these venograms thinking, oh, I can get around, get through some of those blockages. Perhaps you know that there's blockages, you've got all these collaterals filling in the picture on your left. But when we think about bypasses, what are we thinking about? You know, these patients who have multiple collaterals, they've got blocked veins, and I'm thinking, how much blood am I going to lose by cutting into this patient because they've got these uh, hyperextended veins, they've got multiple collaterals that have developed uh, in their subcutaneous or deeper tissues, and that it's going to be uh, somewhat scary. Uh, one of the procedures, bypasses, that I have done and will continue to do is uh, what's called the PALMA procedure, a fem-fem bypass for somebody with chronic occlusion who I cannot or my partners cannot get through one side of their iliac system. Most of the time you can recanalize somebody and you can stent it as Dr. Coogan showed, uh, but this is a decent procedure uh, that can be done, a fem-fem bypass for venous disease. And these, this is just a drawing of multiple different uh, procedures. So, you know, the one that Dr. Peden and I talked about for my patient was really going from uh, his iliac vein up until his, above his diaphragm. Uh, for sake of time, I will let you all read all of that. These are the, uh, uh, the recommendations from the American Heart that I talked about in circulation by uh, Dr. Kahn. I would uh, refer you to the three recommendations for endovascular, and they actually do mention and surgical treatment. So it's, these possibly can be considered, whether it's endovascular or operative. Again, the level of evidence is not high because there haven't been multiple studies. Nobody has a ton of experience. So in summary, you need a, a broad armamentarium. You need to be able to do your endovascular procedures first. Uh, again, you want to heal these ulcerations, but you also don't want the patient to bleed to death. Uh, and consider endovascular first, perhaps surgery as a, a second line therapy. It's hard to make evidence based recommendations here. Again, there's not much out there. So, you all are the next generation. Again, I encourage you to develop something fabulous. All the stuff you're doing now, it's because somebody sat in your seat and they thought about some of these problems. And that's it. We might have uh, time for a couple questions.